Look, I have to assume by now people who care to watch a YouTube video about the latest Star Wars have seen like five of them, but I have been so invested in this franchise for so long, I have to say a few things about the way they wrap this whole thing up. And to save some of your time, not a fan. Look, I know this channel isn't about movies, but I'm I'm so short on time with the move and everything. Uh, so I wanted to do something a little bit easier, something that I could just really talk to you guys how I felt about the rise of Skywalker. I have some things lined up for when I'm settled in in the new place. I got the new uh, Red Magic 3 phone, uh, gaming phone. I love this thing, and so that's dropping very soon. But now that I, I don't have a whole bunch of time, I just wanted to talk about this movie with you guys. I made a few notes here. This is going to be quite disorganized, I expect. Tiny history lesson to get us going. So back in 2012, Disney bought Lucasfilm for, what, I think $4.5 billion, and we all knew that that meant new Star Wars movies movies were coming out. This news was met with a lot of uh, skepticism. People didn't trust, it seemed, Disney to carry on with, uh, with uh, what, I, I can't talk, what, what, what just happened there? People didn't trust Disney to do a good job with Star Wars. Not me, I was very excited, I was very optimistic, I thought they were doing a good, like the MCU was still in its infancy back then in 2012, but I already had an idea that Disney, like, I was like, when did Disney buy at Marvel? Am I remembering this wrong? Yeah, it was 2009, so I was right. See, I did remember they already, Marvel already belonged to Disney by then, because I remember thinking, look, what they're doing with Marvel, it's pretty good, and Star Wars could very well be a big, like, large cinematic universe, not unlike what, uh, what they're doing with Marvel, so it, it made sense to me. Some people, some Star Wars fans were outraged. I thought, no, bring it on, I want to see new Star Wars movies. So when Force Awakens came out in 2015, I was ecstatic, and I had, it was a great movie-going experience. When, when the, the title came out uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and the Star Wars title came on the screen. I remember people like cheering and clapping. And the, the theater came down, man. It was people were so excited, and so was I. I. I joined in in the excitement. I liked the movie. I thought it was great. And in repeated viewings, I ended up seeing it four times in theaters. So I'm part of the problem, I guess. It really didn't hold uh, to scrutiny, right? Like, it didn't age very well. It very much was a carbon copy of A New Hope. And I guess we kind of expected that with this new spat of soft reboots. So it, it was serviceable. I guess that's the best way to describe The Force Awakens. It was serviceable. It suffered from a lot of the usual J.J. Abrams trappings, like, you know, the mystery boxes and things like that. Um, but I, I thought it was a great film. Uh, then... 2017 came along, um, and uh, The Last Jedi by Ryan Johnson. Now, I have mentioned this on the channel before, and on Twitter to anybody who will listen. I'm not a huge fan of Ryan Johnson. His magnum opus, or at least until recently, Looper, was a movie that drove me to the edge of insanity, because I hated that movie with a passion, and everybody seems to love it, or at least think it's just fine. The big problem, little side road here we're gonna take, the, the big problem I have with Looper is that the whole, the, the gist of the movie, like the whole conceit of the movie doesn't make sense to me. Like, it, the whole movie hinges on there's these assassins, and they are sent back in time, and they're, they kill themselves in the past. But they are, and, and that's how the mafia in the future gets rid of like undesirables. They send them back in the past to be killed by these these contract killers called loopers. And then when their contract is up in thirty years, they get sent back to be killed by themselves, thereby closing the loop. The whole premise of the movie, the rule of the the world that this movie takes place in, depends on a contrivance that doesn't make any sense. That they tell the loopers that they're going to be sent back in time to be killed by themselves. That's what puts the that's the conflict that gets the movie going. And. I hated the fact that like none of that makes any sense. There's no reason for them to be telling the loopers that. And that would be so easy to fix in the script. Just make it so the loopers one day find that out. Because the rules, the way they're set up, don't make sense. I could go into a whole video about why I hate Looper. But basically, I did, the idea I had from, from Ryan Johnson, like the idea I got from him is that he creates this like world that he wants to work so like he wants so badly for that to work in the way that he wants it to work that he creates all these plot contrivances that don't really make sense. The, the, the rules don't... Anyway... So I wasn't a fan of Ryan Johnson going in, so I, I kind of expected not to like the, the Last Jedi, and I hated it. And I'm not. It's like people. Okay, why? Why does everything have to be about politics today? Like I know that the, the the movie and the way it was received by both like the big discrepancy between critics and the audience. A lot of it has to do with politics, which I fucking hate. Like. Can we just have a movie? Like, it can be good or it can be bad on its own merits. Like, why do we have to drag politics into everything, man? Fuck! Anyway, not a fan of The Last Jedi, and I don't have a problem with a movie 
subverting expectations. It's just that, again, just like with Looper, there's a lot of rules that, like, they're, they're... Look, this video is not about The Last Jedi. I already made a video about The Last Jedi. I'll link it below if you want to go check it out. But my points, like, the, my opinion of that movie today is the same as it was back then when I first reviewed it. So, we're going into... Uh, the Rise of Skywalker. Again, J.J. Abrams is coming back, and he has a, a, a difficult task because he established a lot of things in The Force Awakens, then Ryan Johnson came and, and tore a bunch of those things down, and now we get J.J. coming back, so either he continues the story that Ryan Johnson gave him, or he pulls a dip move and basically retcons half of The Last Jedi. And this is the problem with this new trilogy as a whole. There was obviously no planning whatsoever. There's, there's very clearly, they, they were missing a Kevin Feige, is that how you pronounce his name? They were missing a Kevin Feige, like what MCU has, to give them, to give the whole thing like this, like, this direction. So I made a few notes here uh, that I want to go through, right? So the, the whole problem with this new trilogy, and this is something that I felt upon re repeated viewings of, of The Force Awakens. The Force Awakens renders the triumph of the heroes in uh, Return of the Jedi basically pointless because we're back exactly where we were before when we last saw these characters. There is a new empire, and make no mistake, the first the First Order is effectively the empire. We have a new emperor because that's what Snoke like. That's the role Snoke is fulfilling here. It's a new emperor. We have a new Darth Vader because that's basically who Kylo Ren is. We have this new uh, desert child that goes on a wild adventure. We have the the droid with the message from like it's we went right back to where we left off they wanted so badly to go back to the familiar ground that they undid everything that the heroes accomplished in return of the jedi and that's just so lazy and boring from a storytelling perspective i wanted to see give me something from the new jedi order that luke presumably try to get going and fail like that's all we know that he tried something and failed and we don't really get to see that which is lame we are told that it didn't work out, but we're not shown. And that's like the, the, the cardinal sin of movie making. Show, don't tell, right? So we don't see the New Republic that would happen from like the ashes of the Empire. We don't see the New Jedi Order. We don't really see what our characters, like the, our beloved characters have been up to in, in the intervening years. And that's just, like I said, it's lazy. What's the point? We're right back to Empire versus Rebels because again, the Resistance is the Rebel Alliance. Uh, First Order is the Empire. Functionally, they are the exact same thing. It's pointless. Palpatine's characterization really bugged me because it's it's implied that he used some kind of cloning technique to come back to life. Oh, and by the way, we all knew Palpatine would be in this movie because they brought out Ian McDermott to a standing ovation at, I think it was Star Wars Celebration. So we, we knew that he was going to come out. It was a foregone conclusion that the Emperor is going to be in this. That doesn't mean you get to introduce him in the title crawl like, a, by the way, he's back. That was so messed up. Like the first, the first uh, uh, um, line from the title crawl is the dead speak or something like that. With an exclamation mark, it's like a big thing, the dead speak, and then it tells you that like, he, like the Emperor broadcasted some message threatening uh, um, uh, the galaxy again, like he's back. You don't just, by the way, this guy from the previous movies, he's back now. No. I, I need to know more. Not to mention, okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but wait a second. So the characterization, right? Like it was very confusing because it's implied that he's a clone, that he's died many times before, but he's all messed up. His eyes are messed up. His fingers are all like torn. Like it's, he's like, he looks bad. So I was like, okay, so was he cloned or was some kind of like, they got his dead body from the, the, the explosion of Death Star 2. Like, what? How? What? You, got, you gotta pick one. I feel like when they're writing the script, either they didn't realize that these two concepts clash. Like, either he is like he was alive from the explosion of Death Star or he's a clone, right? They seem to lean heavily towards the clone idea. But then don't show him all messed up because it looks like he survived the explosion, which is even dumber because I saw that and that thing blew to smithereens. So no, he didn't survive that. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, and, and then we're told, I think within the first five minutes, that um, Palpatine literally made Snoke like in a vat, in a test tube, like a bunch of clones. They show like a bunch of like Snokes. Um, and I'm thinking like, what exactly was the point here? Like, they, Palpatine is back. 
and then he puppeteers like a quasi emperor, but it was it was really him all along. But then Snoke is dead, so he's like, "Fuck it, I'll do it now. I'll, I'll come in." Like, why? Why even use Snoke? Wouldn't it make sense? Like the people who make up the First Order, one would think, are former Empire loyalists. So from from a narrative point of view, it would make way more sense. Like the Emperor would probably rally the troops much better than this like virtual unknown. Like it's stupid. All of it's stupid. And from a storytelling perspective, it's like. So he had the emperor, and then he died, and then we had a new emperor, but then he was being puppeteered by the old emperor, who was now back, who was apparently doing everything behind the scenes. That's so stupid, my god. Not to mention that if the bad guy can just, like, come back to life, and he even says, he spells it out, that he's died many times before, that makes it so that the ultimate showdown between the, the villain and the heroes is meaningless because when you have a realistic setting and the bad like the good guy kills the bad guy that's it the good the bad guy's dead but when you have a guy who just comes back i know that the end of this movie they're gonna win and they're gonna kill the emperor but because he's died so many times before i've seen him die before it's pointless like how do i know he's not gonna come back like that's not a a worthwhile victory there's no payoff he can just come back and again going back to like i'm getting ahead of myself i'm remembering things that are not in my notes and i'm like just getting angry so uh, the whole idea, like, uh, Palpatine's plan, ultimately, was to, to get Rey to kill him so that then his spirit would then go and, and, and possess her, I assume. But in the previous movie, Snoke, being controlled by the Emperor, was trying to convince Kylo Ren to kill Rey. So wasn't... Didn't he need Rey alive to then transfer his consciousness to, to her? Like... Trying to make sense of this is stupid because the reality, the real answer is they didn't plan any of this out ahead of time. That's that's the that's the real answer, right? So there's, there's no point in trying to make sense of this. The plot was like something out of a bad video game, right? Because it was like they 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 needed to find the location of the planet where Palpatine is hiding. So they need a, a, a Sith Wayfinder. So they need to ha find this MacGuffin that is going to tell them where to go. And then to find this MacGuffin, they need another MacGuffin, which they just happen to stumble upon, that tells the characters where that first one is. Or I guess technically from their point of view, it's the second one. Because they found the dagger, the Sith dagger, and they, they find the, the Wayfinder, and, and then they find the planet. Which I guess technically the planet is... <sighs> There's so many MacGuffins, at one point in the movie, there's a character that is introduced. For no reason, because you already have so many characters that aren't doing anything in this movie. They introduce a character who is implied there was some kind of a love interest, uh, Poe Dameron's former love interest or something. While they're on this wild goose chase for MacGuffins, this character, this uh, new character, shows up and says, Oh yeah, uh, you guys, it's going to be tricky getting to the First war uh, Order ships. So here's this coin that allows you to get into any of the ships, no problem, no questions asked. So, the movie is introducing an obstacle, and then immediately, the same person who is introducing that obstacle is saying, Okay, by the way, here's like, here, here's how you solve that. Like a key card in Resident Evil that a guy just like dropped, here you go. It's actually, it's actually dumber than that, because a key card at least you get from, like, you kill something. I'm not a, I'm not a Resident Evil guy, so I'm assuming that's how it goes. I could be wrong. But isn't it like that? Like you kill a zombie and oh hey, the zombie just happened to have a key, a key card. So it's even dumber than that. The hold -o maneuver from the previous movie, stupid, like narrative wise, but it looked stunning visually, right? So, okay. That gets retconned because J.J. <laughs> Abrams, it seems, wanted to retcon most of what was established in the last movie. So, again, you have uh, clashing visions. Like the direction isn't, like there's no coherent... Like, oh, it's just, it's just, let's just do stuff. Like, who cares? They did something badass in the previous movie. No, no, no that doesn't work. We can't do that. There's just because, and that's it. The Emperor's final plan was so... Okay, so in A New Hope, they have a, a Death Star. This giant space station that has a laser that explodes planets. So in, uh, in Return of the Jedi, they have the Death Star 2, which is basically a bigger... Death Star, and then in Force Awakens they have the Star Killer base, which is like a planet, a whole planet that is a Death Star. So now the Emperor is like, okay, screw this space station thing. Let's just take that laser and mount it on Star Destroyers because we have a bunch of them. I have a million of them somehow. So let's just have a million Death Star lasers. There you go. So for the fourth time in this franchise, the climax involves a super weapon that the heroes have to stop from being fired in the nick of time. The fourth. Time. And I'm thinking, look, I know this thing is not going to fire. I know that. 
they lampshade this in The Force Awakens when uh, Han Solo, after being introduced to, like, okay, this is the big new Death Star they have, we gotta stop this because it's gonna blow everything up, and he's like, oh, there's gotta be a thing that we shoot, and then it, it explodes the whole thing, right? Because there's always that. That's J.J. Abrams' cheeky way of saying, like, we know, you know. There was a gay kiss. Uh, blink and you miss it, like two uh, characters kiss during the final like scene. And Disney, they're cowards, obviously, because they do it with characters that nobody knows or cares about. In the very back, it's like for two frames, and you can they can easily edit that out for like China. And um, it, it's stupid because it just when you do that, it's like it's so little in in the way of like representation, and it's to the extent that a lot of the LGBTQ community doesn't consider that um, uh, representation at all. They they consider that uh, something they call queer baiting, and I agree. Like they're doing this just to say they're gonna pat themselves on the back and say, "Look, we we threw you guys a bone, right?" But they don't really care because they want those Chinese dollars, so they'll axe that scene right away for the Chinese release. So, look, you know who had crazy amounts of sexual tension in this series? Poe and Finn. You're gonna make characters kiss? Fuck it. It's the last movie in the franchise. Nobody's gonna really boycott Star Wars. You know these online boycotts don't work, so make them kiss. Screw it. I would admire the balls if Disney were to do that, but... Look, companies don't care about politics. They don't really care about being progressive. They care about doing what's expedient in the sense of like, what is going to get people to praise us in, in the West? That we can like easily take out when we market to China. Let's do exactly that. That's what they're doing. It's, I know it's very cynical of me, but you know it's true. They don't care. They do that because they think North America is going to applaud them for it. I feel like I'm getting a little too political here. Let's move on. There's a scene in the movie where Luke as a force ghost uh, manipulates objects, right? And this is something that Ryan Johnson established in the previous movie where uh, force ghost Yoda was able to conjure up or I guess conjure down uh, lightning from the sky um, and I feel like if, if Force Ghosts have the ability to affect the real world like that, that would have come really in handy. That would really have come in handy in the past, in, in this franchise, right? So, it doesn't work. Not only that, but Luke tells Rey that the lightsaber is the most important thing for a Jedi, which goes completely against what he did, you know, tossing the lightsaber behind his back in The Last Jedi. And, look, I understand you can say, like, oh, he changed, right? You know, he's a Force ghost now. He's more attuned with the, with the Force. Now he's seen the ways of the Jedi a little bit better than the previous movie. No. We know why he did that. It's it, it's J.J. just, like, retconning everything from the previous movie. I, he had a vendetta against Ryan Johnson. And I don't blame him, because Ryan Johnson took what J.J. did and pretty much tossed it out. And I know they made, like, public displays of like, no, no, we're super total buddies, we, we, that's not what we're going for, because they have to play nice for the media, but you know, you know what was going on here. Okay, so now the Force is like a fax machine, you can like send objects back and forth, and I get it that they try to like narrow that down to like, no, it's just Rey and Kylo that can do that, fine, whatever, but I still feel like if like characters can just like force email stuff back and forth, it gets a little silly, because like, the Knights of Ren were utterly wasted, and now this one is on J.J. Abrams, right? Because he introduced the concept in the first movie, and then Ryan Johnson said, like, what nights are Ren? And J.J.'s like, okay, let's bring those guys back uh, to do nothing at all, and just get killed in, like, a little scene. What, what was the what was the point? And I know what the point was. It was toys, probably, right? Like, there's probably, like, Knights of Ren toys, right? At a Disney store at the mall. So that's probably why they did it. But it's still so stupid, to, like, that you, you build up, like, the world building about the Knights of Ren. That was interesting. And then they did absolutely nothing with it. Chewie's medal, right? At the end of the movie, Maz Kanata, another character that doesn't really do much in these movies, uh, gives... Uh, uh, Chewie a medal, right? Like the medal that he didn't get 40 years before in A New Hope. This is such blatant, such blatant fan service. And I fell for it. I admit it. When that scene happened, I, I went, aww, like out loud in the theater and immediately felt super stupid because from a narrative standpoint, that makes no sense whatsoever. Do you think after a lifetime of war, Chewie remembers that one celebration of that one temporary victory that he had 40 years before in some stupid medal that he didn't get. He doesn't even wear clothes, right? What do you think he cares for a medal at all? That was just for the audience. And it doesn't make sense that Maskanat is the one correcting the mistake that the Wookiee didn't get a medal because she wasn't there. She was not the one that didn't give him a medal. For that scene to make sense, I think it would have to be Leia that would give Chewie the medal, right? That would that would make more sense. But it's such blatant fan service. It's just, ah, come on. And again, I'm an idiot because I fell for it for like those like 
three seconds. The prophecy about Anakin bringing balance to the Force is completely wasted again because Anakin did nothing. Because Anakin came back to the light side and he killed the Emperor, so he saved his son and he was redeemed and all that. So that's his arc, right? Like he. But then, because the Emperor came back, and the you know there's a new Empire again, and there's a new Death Star, like none of that mattered. Which means the prophecy was bunk. In the end, it was really Rey that figured it all out, that saved the day, and Rey was a Palpatine. So Anakin didn't bring balance to the Force. This movie made the previous stories retroactively worse because it just undoes what they did. The mystery of how Miles Kanata got Luke's saber is not explained at all, so that's chalk it up to another one of uh, JJ's mystery boxes that he loves so much. He loves mystery and intrigue, but he forgets to have it pay off. It's a big problem. If you watch Lost, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Finn has three different love interests in this series. So at first he's infatuated with Rey, asking if she has a boyfriend and stuff. Then in the second one, he is kind of paired, like romantically paired with Rose Tico. Um, which, by the way, she's in this movie for like a minute. Which is again, it looks like JJ had a checklist of things people didn't like about the previous movie and he went on correcting that, those things. I'm talking so much, I filled up the entire SD card with my rambling. That's why there was that weird cut right there. So as I was saying, they basically give him a girlfriend of sorts who was is also a former stormtrooper. Um... I guess they just needed to give him somebody so like and make that character be exactly like Finn. There, there you go. It's, it's also with the characters dying and coming back together. That was annoying too. So like, Chewie, uh, there's this like fake out where we believe that Ray accidentally killed him as just trying to like pull back the transport that he had been kidnapped in, and Kylo Ren is on the other side pulling towards himself, and then she accidentally activates these like force lightning powers and, and explodes the transport and we all think that Chewie died but then like I think 10 minutes later he's like no he's he's alive he's fine there was another transport that we didn't see so they kill Chewie and he's back right away then they kill C-3PO by erasing his memory because then at one point C-3PO becomes yet another uh, MacGuffin because he has to translate the Sith dagger to find the Wayfinder but then his programming doesn't allow him to translate um, the, the Sith language which, which is stupid because in, in, in the franchise has established that even though C-3PO can't exactly act in a way that would defy his programming, there are ways around that. In Return of the Jedi, uh, Han Solo is about to be cooked alive because apparently the Ewoks, that's something people forget. The Ewoks are like vicious. They eat people. So C-3PO says, oh, it's against my programming to uh, impersonate a, a deity or something like that. I can't remember the exact lines, but then... Um, Luke is just like, okay, just, just play along, and then he makes the chair that C-3PO is sitting on levitate, and he doesn't really do anything to prevent himself by a mission to make it so that the Ewoks think he's a deity. So he, we have established in this franchise with the same character that he can kind of you know, bend the rules of his programming a little bit to help his friends. So why not just have C-3PO like point towards where uh, the, 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 the Wayfinder is? Like he's not translating it, he's not conveying the, what is written there, he's just pointing to a direction. That's just me thinking here. So they kill Chewie, they bring him back. They kill C-3PO because, you know, he's raising his memory so that he can go against his programming and translate the dagger that he's not allowed to, trans to, 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 uh, to translate. But then his memory is brought back so he's the same character that he was before. So there's no death. We don't lose that character. There's this very poignant scene in the trailer where uh, he says, I just want to see my friends for a last time. Which makes no sense because you don't know these people. This is not Luke and Leia and Han. These are characters you barely know who treat you like shit the entire movie. So that didn't make any sense. But then, you know... R2-D2 just happened to have a backup on a thumb drive or something, and then, okay, C-3PO's back, Rey dies, and she's brought back together, because now we have force healing, by the way, that I mentioned that we have force healing now, and I, I'm not, again, I don't have a problem with new force powers being introduced, and force healing is kind of cool, but when you can just basically bring characters back to life, and again, several characters, four characters in this movie were brought back to life, so we have Palpatine, Chewie, 3PO, and uh, and Ray and 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 I guess and I guess Kylo Ren too because there's a fake out where we think he fell in the pit but then he's back. I'm getting whiplash from all these characters dying coming back. The last like that last little like exchange between Palpatine and Ray where Palpatine says I am all the Sith and then Ray very predictably like we could see that coming a mile away. She says and I'm all the Jedi. It reeked of like an Avengers Endgame moment that they wanted to have, like you know how Thanos say I'm, I'm inevitable or something like that? Or I, I can't remember what he said exactly. Great film, don't get me wrong, I just can't remember the exact line. And then 
uh, Tony Stark says, going a, a call back to way back from the first Iron Man movie, and he says, and I'm Iron Man, and then he snaps. Um, it's a great moment in Avengers, and here it felt super hammy, like it felt fan fiction-y. Like, I felt like I was reading a Star Wars fan fictional live journal in 2002. It was that bad. Okay, this video is way longer than I wanted it to be. My point is this. I'm so done with Star Wars. Like, 100% done. I'm not going, like, I don't know what else they're going to be doing. It looks like they're going to, like, pump the brakes on Star Wars for a little bit, which is probably good because we could use a, a, a little breather from Star Wars. But I am done. Still a huge fan of the original series. The prequels, this is something that's coming up a lot. Like, are the prequels better in, in hindsight compared to these movies? They're still really bad movies, and they're really flawed. But I saw them when I was pretty young. The first one came out in 1999. I was 14 or 15, depending on the month, I think. Um, so I, I do have a soft spot for them, as most people my age. And, and younger, too, right? Maybe if you're, like, 10 years younger than me, maybe that's your Star Wars, the prequels, right? They're bad. They're horrible. They're, the pacing is weird. The characters are flat and boring. The story gets really bogged down in the whole political stuff that just isn't exciting. That's the thing, too. Like, I, I hear a lot of people deflect criticism from Star Wars by saying, like, oh, this is a movie for a space race or it's for children, right? Like, we, we've all heard that. We know the meme. But if you watch episode one again... Like, that's not a movie for children, let's be honest. Like, I know Jar Jar is silly, and we have, you know, uh, uh, Jake Lloyd being a kid, like, the relatable kid, right? The, but it, but it's a movie about, like, weird, like, political machinations. They're not even the fun kind, like the House of Cards kind. It's, like, it's boring. Like, try to watch episode one again. It's, it's incredibly boring. But I will say this, to their credit, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but at least George Lucas had a vision. I'm not saying it's a good vision. Let me make this clear. Not a good vision. But some vision, some direction, is better than just, like, taking the wheel and going like this. And then passing the wheel to another guy and then grabbing it back like, no, 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 you, you suck at this. Let me, let me do this again. I am done with Star Wars. That's it. Let me know how you feel about it. Maybe you loved it. Look, I am extremely jealous of the people who loved all movies, right? Like, I have friends who love all of them, who love uh, Force Awakens, who love The Last Jedi, who love this movie. I am jealous of you because, you know what? I, I came to the sad realization that even though I consider myself a Star Wars fan my entire life, there's, like... Two movies that I consider really good, like really, like without, there's A New Hope and, and Empire Strikes Back. Return of the Jedi is the first Star Wars movie I saw as a kid, so that's the one that introduced me to that whole universe and those characters, so I have a soft spot for it, but it's clearly, undeniably, the worst movie of the bunch, of the original trilogy, that is, anyway. Man, let me know. What I'm trying to say is this, if you love these movies, don't think I'm telling you that you're stupid or you have poor taste or whatever, because who gives, like, who cares? If you like a movie, you like a movie. Like, I don't, I don't put a lot of stock in, like, oh, that's good taste, that's bad taste. Ultimately, life is what we make of it. If you, if you love a lot of things, I believe your life is better for it. So if you love these movies that I happen to hate, all the power to you. I mean this 100%. I don't think you're stupid or you have bad taste. Like, who, who gives a shit, right? Like, just enjoy things. Let me know in the comments down below. Regular videos as soon as I organize the mess that my life is right now. God damn, this is a long video. All right, that's all the time I have for today. I'm Izzy, and I'm done.